Welcome to part two of the ACIQ install. In this video, we're going to be going through the ACIQ installation process, and it's not going to necessarily be a how-to, although we will cover kind of the before and after and what are some of the things that we do as a company on a mini split installation that are some of your just best practices to make sure that you don't get leaks and that you just do a good job on the installation and that you get a nice clean installation. And that's going to be using things like line hide as well as I'm going to explain why we're using a wall mount condenser versus just mounting it directly on the slab later in this video and just some of the other things that you want to do if you are considering one of these ACIQ systems we're going to show you some of the best installation practices just so that way you have a system that works well because you can ask any uh, contractor in the industry and they will tell you that most brands across the board are uh, very similar but really what it comes down to is installation quality and so if you are following those installation best practices you're going to have a system most likely that functions reliably every once in a while there are you know a bad batch of systems with different manufacturers so that's happened with everyone but 99% of the time it's going to be a matter of installation error if you are having issues so in this video we're going to cover some of the things that can make for a quality clean installation and we're going to show you this system in action and if you haven't already checked out part one part one is of the ACIQ series it was where we just did a review of the equipment and I actually talked about some of the specs because this is actually a cold weather heat pump that heats all the way down to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit so after we're done with this installation this week it's actually relatively warm it's in you know the teens and 20s are the lows and so we want to really put it to the test and so we're actually going to be doing a third video follow-up after this sometime over the next month or two when we get a really nice cold night where we can put it to the test and show you how it keeps up even in very cold weather so what you're looking at here this is actually going to be the location of our condenser which is the outdoor unit and we're actually going to be putting in a wall mount installation and I'm going to show you what that wall mount looks like and some of the specifications here in a second but the big thing is is the reason we're using a wall mount unit versus mounting this on a concrete slab or a pad is because in a heat pump application in a cold weather climate someplace that has snow where it gets below freezing you need to have clearance underneath the heat pump for it to be able to drop ice and so we could either put it on a stand but because this is kind of on a graded hill we want it's just going to make for a cleaner installation if it's mounted directly to the wall so that way even if you know dirt erodes or they get heavy rains over the next 10 years rather than worrying about that stand shifting because it's mounted directly to the structure that's not going to shift with any sort of erosion or any sort of rain so that's one of the installation best practices we like to do on cold weather heat pumps again you can do a heat pump stand if you have a solid you know if there was a concrete grade here and it was level and it was flat there's nothing wrong with using a heat pump stand we do that quite often but in this particular application because we don't have that we want to go ahead and mount it to the wall it's going to just make for a cleaner installation and the functional aspect of that that I mentioned earlier is that you want to make sure you have at least 12 inches clearance above the highest snowfall beneath your heat pump so that that way there's space for the ice to drop and break because you will actually see as that water when it's going through the defrost cycle what happens is the reversing valve kicks in and it goes through a defrost cycle and all the frost that builds up on the outdoor unit your condenser that's going to be on the wall here melts and then that melted water drains through the drain hole on the bottom of the heat pump when it's as cold out as it is right now what's going to happen is that's obviously going to turn to ice and icicles and so you want those icicles to be able to break and fall off the bottom of the heat pump during those defrost cycles and so that's why we make sure that we have plenty of clearance so that it has space for those icicles to drop now one of the things i mentioned earlier was what's called a service disconnect now this is an electrical service disconnect and this is what's called a non-fuse disconnect and i'll show you what that looks like but the difference between a fused and a non-fuse disconnect is that a non-fuse disconnect as you can see it doesn't have fuses in it it's just a straight disconnect that kills power to the unit now this is part of a code requirement unless it's in line of sight with the panel the bottom line is that you want to be able when you're servicing these units the reason that a service disconnect is a code requirement is you want to be able to kill power to the unit so that way when you're diagnosing it or troubleshooting it in the future you're able to kill power to it and someone's not gonna say oh the AC is not working and come over and just turn the power on while you're in the middle of working on it with a service disconnect it doesn't matter if the breaker in the unit is on or off this is off so there won't be power going to the unit so it won't be live when you're working on it so that's the purpose of a service disconnect like I said that is a code requirement but it is not required if the condenser is within the line of sight of pan of the electrical panel so if the electrical panel was on the side of the house and it was within 20 feet or 25 feet that would pass in lieu you would not necessarily need a disconnect because while you're working you can see if someone's about to turn on the electrical panel and yell hey don't turn that on I'm working on this and so 
This is something that's going to be going in today. So that's our service disconnect. And then something else that's an installation best practice that we use is what's called line hide. Now line hide was something I mentioned earlier and all it is, is it's basically, this is actually a kit that you can get through HVAC Direct, which is also a distributor of ACIQ. But if you look at line hide, all it is, is it's basically looks like rain gutter. The reason we like to put in line hide is because it makes for a nice, clean, tidy installation and it keeps things concealed. A nice thing about line hide is that it is 100% paintable. And so after you put it in, if you want, you can paint it to match the color of your house. So it completely blends in. You just have less of that, you know, mechanical appliance look behind you. Now, right behind me on the inside is where we're actually going to be mounting that wall mount unit that I mentioned. And then right here is going to be where the condenser is. So we don't have that long of a line set run. However, one thing to keep in mind is you actually do have a minimum length. I believe on this installation, it's 10 feet is what it says in the manual. So you do want to have a little bit, you can't just have like a one or a two foot line set length. It's going to be rare that you ever run into that. Normally you're going to have at least, you know, a 10 to 15 foot line set run. That's what we have going on here. Condenser is going to go here. We have about a 10 foot line set run as well as the electrical. And the nice thing is that the indoor units on all these mini splits are actually powered off of the condenser with a four wire. And that four wire can be ran inside the line height as well with this. The only thing that's going to be ran separate and you might be able to see behind me is there's a third hole under but that's going to be a for our condensate line. The condensate line is actually going to be ran and terminated outside just directly into the ground. And because of vicinity of for ease of installation, that's going to be the easiest way to do it. Now we are inside and behind me is the indoor unit. Now this is a floor mounted unit and this is not as common of an application. At least we don't install a lot of these floor mounted units. These can also be mounted on the ceiling. They can be mounted on the wall. This is actually off the floor a little bit, but the bottom line is that we don't install these that often but the reason it made a perfect application for this particular installation is that this is primarily a heating application. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that when you walk into a room, if the heater is on, typically there's what's called a thermocline. And that means it might be hot in the top half of the room and it might be cooler if you get closer towards the floor. And that's where, you know, the old expression of like heat rises, which heat doesn't actually technically rise. What happens is heat when mixed with air makes the air less dense and therefore the less dense warm air rises. But you know, for simplicity's sake, we could say that heat rises. The reason that we're putting in a floor mount unit is because this is a cold weather heat pump application. And this is primarily being used for heating. It's not being used for air conditioning at all. It was the perfect application because when you have something on the floor, this is going to be pulling in air from the coldest part of the room and then heating it up. And so you're going to get more even heating that way. Just like if your primary use of a system was cooling or you were looking for a cooling only application, or primarily a cooling application, then a head unit mounted on the wall, a mini split type of head unit that you're all used to thinking of when you think of a traditional mini split, those are gonna be better application because they are higher in the room. So therefore where all of your hot, warm air is going to collect in the room, that's gonna be the source of heat removal because it's gonna have an evaporator coil inside that mini split that's actually pulling heat out of the hottest part of the room. So for this application, because it's heating primarily, that's why we went with a floor mount unit versus a mini split and ACIQ has a variety of products on their website. So they have traditional air handlers. They have slim duct units. They also have cassette units and then a traditional mini split units as well as these floor standing units, as you can see. But I just wanted to explain why we use this one just to maximize its heating capacity. Now in this room, as you can see, there's also fire stove over here. And this is the wood stove that this unit is actually gonna be replacing. Now we're not actually removing the wood stove that's gonna stay, but the purpose of of this installation was actually to reduce the workload in the winter because a wood stove, you constantly have to feed it. And this is a very, you know, for someone who lives in the woods, this is a cheap way to heat your house when you have a wood stove, but they're wanting to just not have to have a heat source that they're having to feed constantly. And then they can just have the wood stove as a backup source of heat, maybe on a very cold night. And what we're going to be doing is seeing how this actually stacks up by comparison. So that's why we're going to be coming back on a very cold night to show you this thing in action in 
and see how it's actually keeping up when it's zero or below. So that's, you know, in order for something to qualify for one of the tax credits that are available, like the heat pump credits through the Inflation Reduction Act, it only has to have a 75% capacity at five degrees Fahrenheit. And this is close to 100% capacity at five degrees. So it has, it's well above that. And that's why it qualifies for that tax credit or that rebate if you're applying for that. But the COP on this is also, it has to be above 1.75 at five degrees, which is well above that as well. So I explained that in the first video, part one of this. So again, if you haven't checked that out yet, I'll make sure to link that at the end. We're gonna get to finishing the rest of this installation and show you what goes into that so you can see the finished product. And I'll explain what we're doing kind of as we go. So right now we've actually finished the ACIQ heat pump installation and it's 100% up and running. Now, as you can see, the condenser is mounted on the stand. You can see we have about that two feet of clearance I mentioned. Give you some close-ups of the line hide so you can see why we like using line hide, kind of the best practices for how to use line hide. We have the service disconnect behind us. And one thing that I'll point out on that service disconnect as well that we installed is what's called a surge protector. Surge protectors are part of our installation best practices that we like to use because surge protectors, actually, if there's a, a power surge from the grid or a spike or something from a transformer, basically it'll absorb that. And instead of frying the electronics on the board or frying the compressor, it'll actually that in theory, the surge protector is supposed to help with that and absorb those power fluctuations. So that's why we put a surge protector on each of them. And we have our condensate line that's just terminating straight out. Now you can run that down to the ground and away from the house. It doesn't matter that much. This is paintable, so you won't notice it. The line hide is also paintable. That's why we like to use it because even though it's white right now, it's basically a blank slate like rain gutter. And so you can just paint that to match the color of your house and then it blends in and makes for a nice even appearance. Now, one of the things I like to point out on line hide on best practices on how you install it. Now, technically in here, we would normally put a corner piece. However, we didn't have a corner piece that shipped with this kit. So we just tried to butt it up to make it look as clean as possible. And once this is painted, honestly, you're never going to notice that. But the best thing to do is you put down your fitting your back piece first and this whole back piece gets mounted to the wall before you run your line set because once this is mounted to the wall then you have something to run the line set and connect it to and so it makes for a nice way to strap the line set inside and keep everything neat and tidy and organized during your installation. This is the surge protector I mentioned. We put these on every installation and just putting it right into the disconnect is something that's going to prolong the life of the electronic components that are inside the system and prevent power fluctuations or power spikes from causing damage to the compressor, which is in here, or any of the computer PC boards that are inside the system as well. So right now we're out by the unit. As you can see, it's running. It's very quiet. And I'm actually gonna show you some, the actual decibel readings that we picked up on. It was between 50 and 60 decibels, depending on how close we were to the condenser. So right here, it was measuring somewhere around 58 to 60 decibels. However, at the bottom of the stairs, which is about 15 feet away, it was only 50 decibels and it was less than 50 decibels. It was close to 40 or 45 decibels inside the garage that it's mounted to. So you could hardly hear the hum of the compressor through the wall into the garage. It's a very quiet system. It's not as quiet as a wood stove, but nothing's as quiet as wood, except, you know, wood can be noisy when it's crackling. But bottom line is that it passes my standards test in terms of whether or not I would say this is a quiet system. It's definitely not noxiously loud by any means. It's a very quiet system, which is what you would expect from a high end cold weather inverter heat pump. So we're inside at the indoor unit right now. This is running. This is on low fan speed, so it's not very loud even in high you can definitely hear the fan when it's on but it's still not something that's obnoxiously loud it's what you would expect from a typical mini split unit very quiet and puts out a fair amount of heat. Now, as I mentioned in the specs video, this particular unit has a cooling, it's a two ton unit, but in heat pump mode, it actually has an output of 29,000 BTUs. So this is actually going to be replacing their wood stove just as their primary source of heat. So they're not having to constantly feed the wood stove because it becomes just a time consuming and you know physical process. And so they're wanting something that's a little bit lower maintenance. So we're gonna run this the next few months. It's not going anywhere in a few months, but we're gonna have another 
another follow-up video after this and we're just going to pick one of the coldest nights over that we get over the next couple months now it could be next week could be in a month or two months but the bottom line is we're going to wait for a nice cold night somewhere between zero and five degrees so we can check out its true cold and low ambient cold weather heat pump capabilities see what the true capacity is and put it to the test and also give the my neighbor mary some time to try this out and you know get some feedback from her on how it performs and we'll bring that news to you and that's going to be part three of this ac iq install video so we hope you enjoyed this content if you haven't already subscribed to the channel make sure you do so to stay up to date when we drop those other videos if this is a piece of equipment that you are considering purchasing as i mentioned earlier there's going to be a link in the description with a discount code where you can score a discount on your purchase as well so make sure you check that out if this is something you're considering purchasing and if you have any questions or comments post them in the comment section below we always are taking the comments into consideration when we create content we love to make content that is pertinent and valuable to you so post your comments in the comment section below letting us know what you think about the ACIQ product line do you have any experience installing one of these and what has your experience been all in all it was pretty straightforward for us and so I would there's not very many surprises it seems like very good build quality and it would be like i said something that is working right now and it's about 20 degrees outside at the moment so it's a little bit warmer day but it seems to be keeping up fine putting out a fair amount of heat and so we'll have that full cold weather report for you here in the next few weeks so make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you haven't done so already and we'll catch you on the next episode so hopefully you enjoyed this content and if you did please make sure you smash that like button and subscribe to the channel it's a huge help and is much appreciated Appreciated. And if you are interested in learning more about ACIQ products, there's actually a link in the description below to ACIQ products on HVAC Direct. And if you use that link, you actually get a discount. So make sure you check that out. And as promised earlier, there's a few related ACIQ videos popping up on the screen right now. So make sure you check those out if you haven't done so already. And if the cold night review video is not up yet, it just means we're waiting for a very cold night so we can show you how this thing holds up and performs in extreme cold weather. So if you want to get notified when that video comes out. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and we will catch you on the next episode.